Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. When I was a kid, uh, I used to have swimming lessons uh, in uh, the, the pool where I lived, which is Cochrane, Alberta. It's where I grew up. It's where I went to high school. It's where we lived for really most of my life. And we, that's a picture of me with, uh, swimming with my dad at the Cochrane pool a long time ago now. I've grown up a little bit since then. <laughs> that's, that's supposed to be a joke, but anyway. Uh, I've grown up a little bit since, since then, but I used to have swimming lessons in this exact pool when I was younger. And I'll be honest, I'm a horrible swimmer. Like, I don't know much about swimming levels and, like, advancement, how you go through the levels of swimming. But to be honest, I got to level five. And I don't know, I think that's, like, halfway. I'm not a great swimmer. And there's this one time we were swimming at the Cochrane pool, me and my dad and my sister, we went swimming. And again, I'm not a great swimmer. And I jump in the pool. And all of a sudden, I feel these arms wrap around my neck. And I'm sinking to the bottom of the pool. I'm, like, eight years old. And I'm, like... What is happening? I turn around and I just see my sister hanging on for dear life, panic in her eyes as she's grabbing me and we start floating to the bottom of this pool, sinking instead of floating, I mean. So we're sinking to the bottom of this pool and I remember I was so young and I don't know how to swim. I got another human on top of me. Like I can't even swim properly and we're sinking quickly. And then I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm trying to swim. I'm trying to panic. And all of a sudden, I I feel these these two arms wrap around me and my sister. And instead of sinking, we start floating. And I'm like, it's a miracle, right? Like, I'm like, we did it, right? And and so we start floating. and, 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 And when I realize, I look, and it's my dad. My dad has jumped into the pool. Now, I don't remember if he was fully clothed or if he was wearing a swimsuit. I don't remember. But I do remember that he picked us up and put us to the side of the pool. I remember this vividly. Like I'll, I'll, probably a moment I'll never really forget is this moment in this pool. Now this was a scary, obviously, situation, you know, for an eight-year-old kid. But I remember thinking as soon as my dad lifted me and my sister up onto the side of the pool deck, I remember thinking, man, my dad's my hero, right? Like he saved my life. He sacrificed his own life to save me, right? That's literally how I felt as like a young, I think I was like, yeah, like eight-year-old kid. Now looking back, obviously if my dad wasn't there, the hope would be that the lifeguards would have saved us, right? And I'm assuming they would have, but they would have saved us because that's their job, right? Like that's their job. That's what they have to do. They have to jump in the pool. They don't want to, but they have to. And they jump in and then they save you and then their clothes are wet. And like, ah, that sucks, right? But my dad jumped in. And my dad jumped in not because it was his job, but it's because he loved me. My dad jumped into the pool because he cared about me. He, he didn't want to see his kids get hurt. That's why my dad did it. And that's why he jumped in. And of course, the lifeguards would have done it. My dad did it because he loved my sister and I. He cared about us so deeply. He didn't want to see us, his kids, get hurt, as well as maybe even get seriously injured, right? It's a moment that, again, I'll never forget in my life, this, the sacrifice that parents make for us as children. The sacrifices that people make for us. And I think we've all had moments where somebody, maybe it wasn't our parent, but somebody sacrificed a lot in order to take care of us, sacrificed a lot to love us. I think we all have moments like that in our life. And so today, we're going to be continuing our series called Summer Highlights. And we're going through some of our favorite verses as a church. And we're preaching through them week by week by week. And this is our third Sunday in this series. And we're going to be preaching this verse right here, which is John 15, verse 13, that someone sent in. It's this, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, right? No greater love than, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. What an incredible verse. Sharing the deep love, right? This is Jesus talking, saying, sharing the deep love that Jesus has for you and the deep love that Jesus has for me. But as well as it's a charge for us to do the same, right? It's Jesus saying, this is what I'm going to do. And in response, this is what you should do. John 15, verse 13. You know, and in some ways, this verse kind of goes against some of the things that maybe we would have preconceived when we think about, you know, Scripture's filled with moments where it's like pray for your enemies and love your enemies and take care of your enemies, right? Take for, you know, pray for those who persecute you. Like, there's so many moments where this happens, but it doesn't say the word enemy here. It says friends here. 
That there's no greater love than that of one who lays down his life for his friends. And I want to share just a little bit of the context kind of around this verse as we go into it today. And, and what Jesus is saying. So John 15 verse 12 through 17 This is Jesus. He says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Then we get verse 13. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. This is the context surrounding this verse is really the shift from being slaves to being friends. It says no greater love than one laid down his life for his friends. So the first thought I have today that comes from, you know, this verse is there's no greater love than this. No greater love. You know, one of the most common themes, and if you've been on this planet for like 10 years or longer, less, pretty much all art, not all, but most art is created around the theme of love. Right? You think about when you listen to songs on the radio or you, you watch a movie, how often is the story about love, and even if it's not about love, there's like, lo- there's like love romantic themes kind of blended into art. We see this throughout scripture. I, I Google it. It's, they think that, they don't know for sure, but they believe that there's been over 100 million songs written about love in human history. Over 100 million songs written about love in human history. And that's in all aspects. Some love that's not so great. Some love that's incredible, some love that stopped, some love that kept going. A hundred million songs written about love. Love is a theme that we like to pursue. It's something we try to understand. It's something we try to experience. We all want to be loved. We want to be loved by our spouses. We want to be loved by our parents. We want to be loved by our kids. We want to be loved. It's this inner desire for love. And there's a lot of ways that we show each other love. In fact, there's books written about it. You know, they even say that there's five love languages. Like, how do we speak to each other in the language of love? We all are looking for love. But this goes so deep, it says that there's no greater love. They say, this is the greatest step. This is the greatest thing you could do when it comes to love. Do you want to be good at loving? This is what you do. Lay down your life for your friends. If you want to love your spouse in the best way, lay down your life for them. There's no greater love. There's no greater love than this. Lay down your life for your, for your friends. And I think I've learned over time, laying down my life for people is exhausting and hard, and often I don't want to do it. Right? Like, like to love do, till death do us part. Right? It's like, it's like it can be hard to lay down my life. What that means is I'm laying down my own desires. I'm laying down my own needs. I'm laying down my own wants. I'm laying down my life for my friends. Giving up my opinion, giving it all up to love by giving up everything so I can love people properly. It's the greatest sacrifice because it's so humble. You know, as a nation, as a country, as people, to be honest, we're extremely prideful. You know, really, when we go through life, and we see this so often, it's, it's, it's a pursuit of what's going to make me better, what's going to make me better, what's going to make me more money, what's going to make me look better. Like, that, that's the pursuit. What's going to help me, not what's going to help you. This, this thought of how, how prideful we tend to be. But I find so fascinating about this, no greater love than one to lay down his life for his friends. This is something, laying down your life is something that's respected pretty much across every nation, every culture, every country. Someone who lays down their life is considered a hero, right? It's not just a spiritual thing. It's also just something that as humanity we've we've desired. We love to hear stories of sacrifice, there's so many movies that have been written and made about sacrifice in war or sacrifices in homes and sacrifices as parents, whatever, to help other people. We love when we hear stories of people laying down their life. 
We love hearing these stories. It encourages us. It, it, it helps us become more humble, I think, because we learn, oh, wow, I can learn to love better. But this sacrifice of your life is not a small thing to sacrifice. It's not something that, that, that easily we can do. It can be very hard to give up our life, to give up our desires, to give up our wants for other people. Because again, those who lay down their life for their country are, are, and for their comrades, for their friends, are considered heroes when we read through you know, history. You know, those who sacrifice fame for poverty give up their money so they can go help and feed the poor. These are some of the heroes that we look to and they win prizes and we get excited about it. People who lay down their own ambitions for their children. You know, Beth and I, we recently watched the movie. Uh, it's called King Richard. And uh, this is the story of Richard Williams, who was the father of Venus and Serena Williams, who are some of the greatest tennis athletes of all time. You know, between the two of them, they, I, I Googled this because it's insane. They, they have 122 singles titles combined. And tw uh, 22 doubles titles, most of those were together. 30 Grand Slam singles titles, 14 Grand Slams, double titles, five Olympic gold medals, and they've earned over $136 million over their career. The story of these incredible athletes. But really the story really is about their father who the sacrifice that he made in order to get them to this place where they could actually be coached, where they could actually go and they could actually compete and the sacrifice that he made. And we love stories about sacrifice. We love the stories, but do you know what often we don't love? When we have to be the one to sacrifice. When I have to be the one to say no to something because my kid needs me or my spouse needs me where I want to go golfing, but I shouldn't. But I want to, but I shouldn't. And it's this inner, I'm telling you my mind. Like, like there's this thought of like, should I go golfing today and not spend time with my family? And oftentimes I'm like, yeah. Like I, sh I probably should. I'm tired. I need some rest, right? I've been working hard. I deserve to golf, right? Like for real. This is like how my mind goes. But I have so many moments where I have to be like, it's not about me. You know, when you have two young kids, as many of us have had and many of us do have, sleep becomes a luxury. Not something you are going to necessarily get every day. I'm not sleeping a lot. I'm tired. I'm just like, it's, it's, I'm, I'm tired. And there's so many times where I wake up and I, I pray and hope that Beth will get up, right? I kind of have like one eye open like, did she go? For real. Did she do it? And she probably does the same thing, right? <laughs> we never talked about this, right? It's like this part of our relationship that we don't, you know, we haven't really talked about much. But you know how, you know, I'll be honest, one of the ways that, that I feel most loved by Beth is when I wake up and she's not in the bed. Now that sounds horrible, right? Like, like that sounds so horrible. But what I mean by that is that means she's up with the kids and I get to sleep in till maybe 7.30. If I'm lucky, 8. 8 a.m. My dad used to say, good afternoon, right? You know what I'm talking about? I already mowed the lawn six times today, you know? Got my monarchs on, but you know it's hard to sacrifice. <laughs> it's something that, like, I think is so ingrained in us is that sacrifice is so hard. We don't really enjoy doing it, right? Because sacrifice it means it's going to be painful. But how do you? How do we practically sacrifice for our friends? How do we practically lay down our life? How do we do this? When Paul, when he was writing his letter to the church. In Corinth, he said this about love, and if you've been to a wedding, you've heard this. But this is how we do it. This is the definition of love. It says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. He keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices wherever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. 
You know, if we really, love is sacrifice. It's a sacrifice sometimes to be patient. It's a sacrifice sometimes to be kind. It's a sacrifice to not be jealous, it's to not be boastful, to not be proud or to not be rude. Sometimes it's a sacrifice. Because oftentimes I want my own way. I don't like to admit it, but I can get irritable pretty quick. But this is how we learn to sacrifice, how we learn to lay down our life for our friends is we got to learn how to love properly. Because every one of these things written about love is really about how we interact with other people, right? How we treat each other, how we're patient and kind and not giving up. How we lay down our life, we lay down our opinions, we lay down our desires, we lay down our preconceived ideas for other people, for each other. Fighting for people and not giving up and not losing faith in people and believing that they can change and that God will meet them where they are. We can't give up on people. That could be a sacrifice too. You're not doing the things I told you to do and it's not going very well for you. If you only listened to what I said, then you wouldn't be in this situation. I give up. That's what we do. We can't lose faith in other people. We have to lay down our life for our friends. We gotta be humble, put our agenda to the side and put our plans to the side. Be willing to sacrifice and willing to listen and willing to learn and willing to ask questions. Don't sacrifice your relationships on the altar of pride. We gotta be humble. There's no greater love. No greater love than this and lay down one's life for their friends. You know, and then right after Jesus says this, he then goes on to explain who his friends are, right? Like, so the next thought we have is friend of Jesus. Now this thought always blows my mind. Like, like every time I, I understand this concept that Jesus wants to be friends with me, he, he wants a relationship with me. He doesn't just save us and then walk away. He's like, I'm gonna be here with you through all of your healing. I'm gonna be with you as you recover. I'm gonna be with you Whenever you need me, why? Because I'm your friend. John 15, 14, right? This is how you become friends with Jesus. This is what you do. Pretty simple. You are my friends if you do what I command. Simple. Follow the things I taught you. Follow the ways I've lived. Follow me. And we talked about this a little bit last week in Isaiah 11, two to three. This is our verses for last week, right? And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is talking about Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. This is what Jesus lived out on earth. This was the spirit that he carried as he went out. He, he always was loving and he was always full of knowledge and, and there was rest. The spirit was upon him. He's saying, follow me. Do what I've done. Follow what I've said to do and then we will be friends. We follow his commands. We follow his voice. We listen to the wisdom. We listen to his knowledge. We learn from the obedience that he had to the father when he went to the cross for you and me and took his life for you and for me. When he went to the cross for us, the obedience that that took to go, the sacrifice that took to go. He's in the garden, he's sweating blood because there's so much in, my, in his mind. Yet he still did it because he was being obedient. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me and I'll give you all that I am. The life Jesus offers us is in in friendship with him. The life he offers us is greater than anything else. I think we all know John 10, 10, but the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. The life that God has to offer us is so much better. You know, a lot of the things that we thought would bring us purpose, the things that we thought would bring us satisfaction, the things that we thought ended up actually being the things that were destroying us. 
The things that we thought were going to bring us joy ended up being the things that were killing us. Killing our relationships. Killing our peace. Being a friend of Jesus leads us to a bigger and more satisfying life, more satisfying purpose, a life that is rich in love. Is it easy? It's not. There'll be moments where we want to quit. There's moments where I want to quit. Moments where the pressure of the world and the pressure that's on us as humans from work and family, all of it. There's moments where I think all of us, we're like, I don't know if I can keep going. It's hard. But the love that Jesus shows us changes us. The lo- this love that when we have the revelation of it has the power to change everything. It actually changes. If you read the, through that verse again, it changes what Jesus says about us. We change from a slave to a friend in John 15, 15, right? I no longer call you slaves. Because a master just doesn't confide in his slaves. Now, you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the father told me. How often does a slave become friends with their master? It doesn't happen very often. But the sacrificial love of Jesus has the power to change our title, change our position from slave to friend. Jesus is still our Lord. Jesus is still our master, but we lo- he loves us. He wants more than that. He wants to be close with us. He wants to be friends with us. Share in the wisdom that's placed upon him. Share in it with us. He loves us. You know, the last thing I want to kind of end with this, this, this thought is this last thought of go and do the same. Now I want to read uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm, maybe you're aware of it. You've heard of it. You've heard it before. But this comes from the famous parable shared when first asked, when Jesus was asked, what does it take to inherit eternal life? And then he's later asked, who is our neighbor? Tough question to ask Jesus. And this is how Jesus uh, said in, in, in Luke 10, verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. Jesus always loved telling stories. People would ask him questions he rarely answered. He'd usually ask them another question or tell them a story. And then oftentimes they lead the conversation a little bit more confused than when they entered the conversation. It's like, yeah, Jesus, sweet, but like, what about the question I asked you? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road, right? By chance, a priest, the guy... The guy, I came along. The pastor came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by. The temple assistant, second in command, walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion on him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, this is when Jesus asked the question. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Great question. It's a pretty simple answer. And he probably didn't even want to respond because he didn't like Samaritans all that much. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now and go and do the same. You know, when Jesus asks us to do things, maybe I'm speaking from experience, but I want to, Ask him a few questions first. Right? Like, what must it take to inherit eternal life? And then who's my neighbor? Do I really have to lay down my life for, for my auntie? So She's horrible. Do I really have to lay down my life? Do I really have to sacrifice for my kids? Kind of annoying sometimes. 
Do I really have to give up my own desires, my own wants, my, my own stuff? Do I have to give it up? You know, we love through sacrifice. We love through giving our life. And Jesus could have responded in any way, right? Who's my neighbor? He could have been like everybody. Boom, right, go. But he tells this story. He says, go and do the same. Do the same. I think sometimes we get so complicated. Jesus makes it simple. Go and do the same. The same love that Jesus showed us he, as he rescued us, as he restores us, as he revives us by giving his life as a ransom for many. This is the commandment Jesus gives us. In fact, two times in John chapter 15, he says this in these short verses. John 15, 12, this is, what he, this is how it starts. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And then he says it again in John chapter 15, verse 17. He says this, this is my command. Love one another. Love each other. So he goes through John chapter 15, 12 through 17. He says, this is my commandment. Love one another. Lay down your life for each other as I've done for you. You now, my friends, go and love each other. Go and do likewise. Go and do the same. Go love each other. You know, there's so many ways to love people. The scripture are filled with, and read through the New Testament, there's like, I think it's like a hundred times one another is mentioned. Like, do this for one another. A hundred times, something like that. You know, bear each other's burdens and encourage one another and accept one another and be kind to one another. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Wash one another's feet. Serve one another, comfort one another, pray for one another, be hospitable to one another. Don't complain about one another. Yet the greatest way to love someone, lay down your life for your friends. Lay it all down. Love costs something. It costs something. Are, you, are we willing? Am I willing? Are you willing to make that sacrifice to love? Am I, am I willing? And I think for, for some of us, and oftentimes this comes up, is we answer that question, we're being honest. It's like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can continue sacrificing. I don't know if I can continue giving. And that's when I know, when I know that I'm responding that way, my response is, I got to go spend more time with my father. I'm getting drained. I'm getting tired. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. The thing you desperately need, I'll come and I'll give it to you. But Jesus is saying here, go and do likewise. Do the same thing that I've done for you. You know, in the story of the Good Samaritan, we often compare ourselves to the priest or the Levite or the assistant or the Samaritan. That's where my mind always goes. That's where, where I always think. But oftentimes I realize I'm the one beaten up, bruised, broken on the side of the road. I'm lost and, and Jesus comes and picks me up and helps restore me and pays the bill bandages me up. This way he found me on the side of the road. You know, the truth is, I think that we only become the Samaritan in that story when we realize that we are actually, at one point, we're the one bruised and broken on the side of the road. And we were in need of a savior, in need of a healer, in need of a hero to come and sacrifice in order for us to become healthy and whole and find the freedom we desperately need. I think that's when we realize that that's when we can become the hero of that story. Go and do likewise. Once we've received it, go and do the same. Once we've received the restoration, go and bring restoration to the world, to our families, to our workplaces. Go and do likewise. Go and do the same. Lay down our life for one another. You know the takeaway uh, today? is this, is the greatest act of love is sacrifice. Sacrifice. 
I think some of us were sick of sacrificing. It's hard. It's draining sometimes. It's not easy. That's how we love the best. No greater love. You know, and so let's just celebrate the fact that Jesus found me. He rescued me. He restored me. He made me whole. Let's celebrate that. Let's love that. But then let's share it too. Let's bring that same love. Let's bring that same sacrifice to everywhere we go. It's not easy, but it's beautiful when we can walk hand in hand with Jesus into the future together. So I'm going to pray for us today. Um, and then we're going to, you know, go on our way. But um, Father, I thank you. And Jesus, we thank you. That you, you showed us how. That when you ask us to do something, you've already done it. When you ask us to lay down our life, we thank you that that's exactly what you did for me. We thank you that, that you are the one who restores us. You are the one who makes us whole. You are the one who brings life to our weary bones. And so God, I pray for us that as we learn from you, as we are your friends, as we follow you wherever you lead, as we follow your commands, God, help us learn to do the same, to go and do likewise. Help us learn how to do it. And God, I pray that when we get tired, that when we get weary, we're humble enough to come running back to you. We're humble enough to ask for support. We're humble enough to ask for help. God, help us not sacrifice our relationships on the altar of pride, but help us grow our relationships as we walk and act in humility. So God, I pray that you guide us this week, you lead us this week, Give us opportunities to love this week. Give us opportunities to sacrifice this week. And God, help us have courage and strength that we need to continue going even if we're tired. In Jesus' name, amen.